big thank you to Emer there for a very insightful talk. Emer, it's lovely to have you with us today. So before we go to our next uh, and final interview, just a, a prize announcement for the Poolies voucher. Um, the winner of that prize is Paul Byrne. So Paul, if you can contact us on info at iasset.aero, we'll get back to you with the, with the prize. So our final interactive interview today is with a very special guest, and she's joining us um, in her morning time from Canada. So Marriott is Senior Director of Fleet Transactions and a founding member of Propel Her, an association of aircraft leasing professionals with the objective of creating a forum to exchange ideas, opinions, and experiences around topics relevant to the aircraft leasing industry. Marriott is a pleasure to be joined by today to discuss such an important topic, diversity and inclusion. So I'm gonna start by asking you to discuss your career to date and your journey through diversity. Thank you, Daniel. And first, I'd like to thank you for inviting me today. It's the first time that I get the opportunity to speak to an audience of future leaders in our industry. And I really think that your generation is going to be very important when it comes to bringing action and solution to the question of diversity and inclusion. So I'm really happy to be here. And I also want to thank ISF for still making the time to talk about diversity and inclusion. Uh, because even though things are improving, they're still far from perfect. So it's important that we keep the conversation going. So my small, small housekeeping point as well. Um, so I'm going to say a lot DNI. So that's to refer to diversity and inclusion. Just want to make sure everyone caught that from the start because uh, I, I tend to shorten it a lot. And also, I'm very passionate about DNI, but I'm not an expert other than having lived pretty much my entire career as a gender minority and for a little while as an immigrant in Ireland for seven transformative years. So I, I'm very conscious that diversity is a really large topic, but I'm trying to focus on my experience, which is more around gender and a little bit around the cultural differences. But I know it covers a lot more than that. So uh, thanks for the introduction. And for those who don't know me, I'm originally Canadian. Um, I worked in aircraft leasing in Ireland for about seven years for CIT and Avalon um, in airline marketing in the EMEA region. In 2018, I decided to come back to Canada to join the Air Canada team, uh, where I'm now the senior director of fleet transaction. And our team manages a, a fleet of a little bit over 300 aircraft. We manage all of the leasing and the trading transactions uh, for Air Canada. As you said, I'm a founding member of Propeller and I'll discuss it a little bit later on. So to put things in context, um, I started law school 18 years ago, which sounds like a long time, but for me, obviously it feels like it was yesterday. And at the time, we talked a little bit about um, <clears throat> feminism and diversity and equality. But I think that for most women my age, it, it still felt like it was a concept from the 60s and the 70s when women were fighting for real rights, like access to education, for example. In my class that year, we were 70% women. So, you know, it re re reinforced our sort of false sense of accomplishment. And we thought, you know, why would we talk about diversity and equality? We were absolutely dominating. Unfortunately, that sentiment changed pretty quickly when we joined the workforce. And um, so I joined a big law firm. And very early on, I started noticing some small differences in the type of work that was allocated to us. Um, women tend to receive a lot more administrative work and my male colleagues would be assigned to drafting some complex legal memos with senior partners. My friends and I were often invited as uh, entertainment for lunches and dinners, whereas my male colleagues would be invited to go play eight hours of golf with company CEOs where they could discuss business. So obviously it didn't really feel to me like we were treated equally and that has an impact eventually on a woman's career progression and also on the retention of women in the workplace. At that time, I did get the opportunity though to work on a very large financing for Air Canada with some of the team that I am working with now actually. Um, and that's how I discovered aviation. I discovered how complex and fascinating it was, and I really caught the bug at that moment. But 
I guess, you know, law didn't really make me happy. And I didn't, I really enjoyed learning about contracts and learning about businesses like Air Canada. Um, but I didn't feel like the practice of law was really leveraging my strengths. So in 2011, I packed up my bags and I moved to Ireland to go complete an MBA at Trinity College. In my class, we were 20 men, 11 women from about nine different nationalities um, across the globe. And that's where I truly learned about the power of diversity. So the way that the program is set up, uh, the teams are formed to try to have as diverse teams as possible. And so at the beginning of the program, they make you take a personality test, a Myers-Briggs test, and the groups are formed to have people with different personalities, a different cultural background, different uh, professional background, and some form of gender diversity as well amongst all the groups. So really, you could not be more different than the people you're asked to work with. Um, it was a very challenging and rewarding year. But my main takeaway from that is that truly embracing diversity is hard. It requires a lot of intention. You need to really work at it. It doesn't come naturally. To the contrary, it's very uncomfortable to work with people who are different than you. But if you do manage to work through that and to form a high performing team that's comprised of people who are different than you, then the result is that the, the quality and the depth of the work that you're going to produce is, is so much, it's so far superior than what you could ever do on your own or with people who think exactly the same as you. So I then gained a little bit more um, aviation experience by working on a management consulting project for CityJet in Ireland. Um, and that's how I discovered aircraft leasing. And I thought, wow, this sounds incredible. You know, you can get paid to travel everywhere in the world. That's, that's exactly what I want to do. So I started sending CV until someone was willing to hire me. So thankfully someone did. And I joined the Santos Dumont, who gave me my first opportunity in the industry. And as part of my role, I did a lot of business development across the world for them. So I started traveling extensively and I started attending a lot of industry events. Again, um, very, very challenging at the start. And um, I didn't know anyone, but also I felt so out of place in the industry. I was one of the very few Canadians. I was a woman. I was not an engineer. I never grew up watching planes, and I didn't even know the difference between Airbus and Boeing. So I had a, I had a lot of work to do to, uh, to get myself uh, up to scratch to fit in into the industry. But at times, what's unfortunate is that the industry didn't really help to make me welcome either. Uh, most conference panels were men at the time. Um, I, most uh, senior executive teams from leasing companies were all men, and most of them still are, unfortunately. I would attend industry events where I was at a ratio of one to a hundred, or I would go to a cocktail where they had hired some half-dressed Brazilian dancers. So obviously, I did ask myself quite a few times, what am I doing here? Thankfully, I had some amazing work colleagues and managers who really did make me feel like I had a place in the industry. I think that my uh, cultural diversity was really welcome. Uh, and definitely, for example, at Avalon, my language skills were really valued. And as a result of that, I got to cover some amazing airline accounts uh, in French speaking countries. And through my travels, I also started meeting some like-minded women. And after several conversations, we realized that we face a lot of challenges, which stemmed from the pure fact that we are women doing business in a man's world. And we didn't really feel like we had a platform to discuss those particularities. So really that's how Propeller was born. And you know, it's not only that we now had a platform to discuss those particularities, but I think it was our way to include ourselves in the industry. 
Uh, so for me, it really transformed my journey in this industry because I now had a support network of women who had shared experience. I felt included. I felt like I belong. And it really helped me in my decision to stay in the industry and continue to progress in my career. Uh, it's our fifth year anniversary this year, and it's going to be my two seconds uh, sales pitch for propeller of the day. Um, we have a lot of exciting projects coming up next year. You can follow us on Twitter, on LinkedIn, uh, or propeller.ie. And this year, we're going to be focusing on trying to bring more visible gender diversity in the industry. And we're gonna going to tackle some topics like the investment gap between men and women. Brilliant. Um, and I know we, we've dealt with Propel here before and we've had diff, different speakers as well. So it's, it's a group that we're, we're quite used to. Um, so do students and other people, uh, more, more uh, experienced people joining the industry now, what can they do to move that needle as it relates to, to d and mm. That's a really good question, Daniel. And um, I think, again, Diversity is such a large topic. Um, and I think it might take a few years before anyone is in a position um, where they can have a significant impact when it comes to diversity itself. I think often it has to be led from the top for the initiatives to be put in place. But I think where you can have a lot of impact is around more of the topic of inclusivity. So I'll focus on that a little bit. And I think that it's possible to foster inclusive behavior, which in turn will make for a more inclusive workplace. So what does that mean, practically speaking? OK, so I, I scratch my head a little bit and I, I try to come up with uh, seven practical tips. So bear with me, I'll, I'll run through them. OK, so my first tip and probably the most important one is that you have to be conscious of your unconscious bias. And if you're asking yourself how to do this, I really recommend looking at the implicit project from Harvard, which is a series of tests that you can take to assess your unconscious bias. Now, that's all good. You, you're aware at that time, but this is not something that you can look on day one and then forget about it. You really have to keep checking in with yourself throughout the rest of your career to see where you're at with your bias. And you also have to be very honest with yourself. And I say this because about 10 years into my career, I realized that when I delegated work, I expected a lot more from my female colleagues than from my male colleagues. And now when you uh, realize that you are manifesting a behavior that goes against your own values um, as a result of an unconscious bias, it's something that's very difficult to accept but I think that recognizing it really is the only way to improve and to move forward. My second tip is around the fact that, you know, we associate with people who are like us, whether it's ethnicity, gender, socioeconomic background, it runs really deep and that's because they feel comfortable to us. It's an unconscious bias that we all have. So I'd say try to disrupt that how to do this. So when you start working in a new environment and you've been there for about six months, I have a little exercise that I like to do. For a couple of days, write down the names of all of the people that you talk to on a regular basis. Then have a look around the room and look at the people who you don't talk to on a regular basis and ask yourself, am I not talking to these people because as purely because of my function, for example, because you, you don't have any dealings with them in the workplace? Or is it because they feel a little bit less comfortable to me? And if that's the case, you know, get curious with that little voice inside and, and try to understand why that is and challenge yourself. And like I said before, to truly have inclusive behavior, you, you need intent and you need to work at it. So it's not gonna come easily. You need to purposely include those people in your network but it's a great way to, uh, to add uh, di diversity in your network. My third tip is probably the hardest one, actually. Um, so, and it's to try to be an active bystander. This applies to a lot of situations. And I want to tell you all to stand up for your colleagues if you witness an inappropriate situation when you're with them. Unfortunately, it's just not that simple. 
um, you, you know, you could be witnessing uh, an inappropriate comment that comes from a customer, that comes from a superior, that is made in a particular cultural context. You could just not know what to say on the spot. And I've been at this for a long time now, and, and even myself, um, I've sometimes been at the receiving end of some comments that were so shocking that I really, it left me speechless. I did not know what to say. I didn't know how to address the situation at that time. But what I found is that what's really important is not always to say the right thing at the right time. But when, with, when you're with a colleague, you know, just hearing from your colleague to say something like, I'm really sorry this happened to you. Uh, this was very inappropriate, recognizing the situation. And what can I do next time? How could we address this next time and have a discussion around it and try to come up with a strategy on how to address this? It's already going to make a very big difference for whoever was at the receiving end of those comments and in those situations. Then, you know, I might be wrong, I don't think I am, but I think that your generation is expecting a lot more from employers when it comes to diversity and inclusion. And I want to say to you all, bring those expectations with you in the workplace and hold on to them. And I say that because, you know, it's very simple. Businesses are in business to make money and to make money, they need to get the best people. And if the best people are asking, for employers to do better when it comes to diversity and inclusion, then they will have to do better. Now that said, you know, even if we're talking about it, it doesn't mean that we are where we should be. And don't get discouraged if the pace of change also is not as fast as you expected it to be. It's a journey, we're going to get there and we need you to get there. So something else that you can do when you start working is try to be on the lookout for some low hanging fruits around diversity and inclusion. So small annoyances that you can identify and that you can bring solutions to. I was speaking to a propeller colleague actually who mentioned that in her organization, a group of students had identified the need for more cultural awareness training. So a suggestion that they brought was to have some uh, group for um, lunchtime or breakfast uh, where they leverage the people from within the organization from different cultural backgrounds to come and give presentations about their own culture uh, or particular holidays. And I thought it's a fantastic example of a low hanging fruit that any employer would welcome and support as an initiative. Now I have a tip for all the women listening today. Um, I'd say please get engaged with women's groups and leverage everything that's available to you very early on in your career, even if you don't feel the need for it just yet. Um, I'm convinced that it will help your journey to be easier and help retain you in the industry. And I speak for Propeller, we're always happy to welcome newcomers in the industry and to connect. And as for myself, if ever you find yourself at an industry event and you are alone, intimidated, you don't know where to start, just come and get me and I'll be your anchor in the room and I'll help you navigate through this. I'm always available on LinkedIn as well. You can send me a message. It takes me a little bit of time sometimes to answer if I'm very busy, but I will get to it and I will answer. So any, any questions uh, are welcome and I'll help in any way I can. And I have a tip for the men listening. And I know something that comes up very often is that men wonder how they can be an ally to their female colleagues. So I have a, a few ideas on how you can do it. Um, you know, when we start work, uh, we don't always end up with the most interesting things to work on. Obviously, it's a, it starts, we start at the bottom of the ladder. And um, if you do start noticing though, that your female colleagues are ending up with all of the administrative work, then just offer your help, offer to take some of it and try to break that cycle, cycle very early on. One day when we're back in the office, hopefully maybe, um, we'll sit around conference tables again. And what I see happening too often is that a woman will walk in, the conference table is full, so she's gonna go and sit in the corner of the room instead of sitting at the table. If that's the case, you know, push your chair, Tell her to come and squeeze in. It's a very simple thing to do. And um, something that happens to me very often is that I'm, I'm 
very often the only women in the room. Mm -hmm. Some, sometimes I'm in meetings where there, there'll be 15 men and I'm, I'm the only woman. I've been at this for a long time, so I still I'm very comfortable expressing my opinion, but I know it's not the case for everyone. So if you see that a woman is the only one in the room and she might not feel comfortable expressing her opinion, make sure that she's asked for her opinion. And if no one is listening, be the one who interrupts everyone to say, I'm sorry, I think Marie is trying to bring up a point. And then my last tip, and I'm going to end here, I know there's there's so much that could be said about this, but we're limited in time, is um, don't hesitate to publicly support DNA initiatives and views that your network might be sharing. And I'm saying this because we need to continue to spread awareness, uh, which eventually is going to lead in concrete results in improving DNI in the workplace. And even today, the stigma associated with feminism still exists. And um, some people are still questioning whether inequality in the workplace exists. Like it's a little bit like global warming. We still have to convince people that it's real. Um, and I have to say, you know, even for myself personally, I still get nervous every time I make a public statement with a feminist undertone or when I accept to do a talk like today, um, I'm, I'm worried about the, uh, the perception in the public. But at the same time, um, you know, some people in my network never fail to support me when I do, and I appreciate that so much. And I keep doing it because I know that being visible is very important. And we keep hearing that if you don't see it, you can't be it. So please support those who dare to be seen. Mary, that was fantastic. And the seven, seven pieces of advice is the best place for us to end today. So I want to thank you for your time. Um, and hopefully when things clear up, you can come back to Ireland and we can, we can all meet up. Yes. So thank you again. Thank you, Daniel. Um, so next up, um, I'm just going to announce our last prize for the day. So this prize is an IASA goodie bag, which includes vouchers from Poolies and, and much, much more. So to be able to chance of winning this, go to www.iasa.aero and sign up to our new membership platform. And we will announce the winner later on this evening on our social medias. So I'd like to introduce our next two uh, keynote speakers. So the first one is Connor McCarthy. So Connor joined the airline industry 42 years ago as an aircraft avionics apprentice. He won a, an engineering scholarship for Aer Lingus and he graduated from Trinity College and rose to the level of EVP, was appointed chief executive of Aer Lingus Commuter at the age of just 28. He has served as the director of ground operations and safety at Ryanair, co-founder, shareholder, and former director of AirAsia, founder of Plane Consult, chairman and CEO of Dublin Aerospace, and as a non-executive chairman of Stobart Air. Connor is now the Emerald Airlines Chief Executive Officer. Following Connor, I'll be joined by Dermot O'Congola. Dermot will become CEO of the new Irish Aviation Authority once the separation is formalized. Dermot was CEO of Malta Air, a Ryanair Group subsidiary, and has held previous positions as senior manager in Ryanair, DEA, and on post. He was appointed CEO designate slash aviation regulator in September, 2020. It's a great pleasure to be joined by both Connor and Dermot today. 